For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, Professor of Law in the Institute. Jan Klazuski joins me to discuss his memoir titled Blood and Silver, A True Story of Survival and a Son's Search for His Family Treasure. Your memoir describes how before fleeing Poland for Romania, your father buried the family silver on the edge of the forest. So briefly tell us how in 2019 you were able to fulfill a long-held ambition of retrieving the silver. I'd always heard about the silver that my, the family silver that my father buried literally when the Russian army was approaching when World War II started. The Germans had approached about two weeks earlier and then the Russians were coming and they were near the Russian border. So they decided to leave quickly. My father who was newly wed to my mother and his brothers. They left quickly, but before they left, buried the family silver in the forest. And while I was growing up and throughout my teenage and adult years, I had this dream of one day going to look for the silver. And I couldn't do that in the 80s and 90s because it was communist. What's important to say is that the borders were moved straight after World War II, so that Poland lost the whole of the eastern region and the, the town of Lviv, which has been in the news recently, as well as my grandfather's estate, all that went to Russia, to then the Soviet Union, and it was under the communist yoke, and so it was impenetrable. And my grandfather, he refused to leave, and he spent the rest of his days in now Russia, or Soviet Union rather, until he died in 1960. So although he lived for another 20 years after the war, my father and his brothers never managed to see him again because of the Iron Curtain in those days. And talk to us more about discovering that you were HIV positive from receiving contaminated blood products. I'm a hemophiliac, which um, is a blood deficiency. So there's 12 little processes, chemical processes that happen to make your blood clot. And hemophiliacs worldwide lack the factor number eight. So we get transfused with factor eight concentrate. When I was a baby, I had to get whole blood. But over time, they realized I don't need whole blood. I don't need plasma. I just need a fraction of plasma, and it's called factor eight. And I inject that into my vein. And ironically, it was the richer people in South Africa that were getting the concentrated factor that was imported from both the United States and I spent time in England that I got the, the concentrated factor and not the, the cryoprecipitate, which other hemophiliacs were getting, that I got a contaminated dose of blood or factor eight, which um, I don't know where, which I can't say it was from the American batch or where, where that it was while I was a student in London, where I was being treated with their concentrated factor. So it could have been any of those that I got um, infected. And can you tell us more about your discovery of McGregor, a small village in the Western Cape, where you and your wife, Louise, built your home? When I started work at UCT, which was way back in uh, the late 80s, about, I think about 89, I was working away in my new career. And then I decided I need to do something to get away from books and computers and have a break and do something with my hands. I thought of doing a woodwork course or something. But then I heard about this pottery course in McGregor. So I signed up for it, for this residential pottery course. And I loved the people that were running it. It was myself and about eight students here for a week doing pottery. And I started coming back for weekends. And eventually I bought a plot in McGregor. And then when I met Louise, she's an architect. She designed a house. And she built a house where I'm talking from now, here in McGregor. And you also narrate how you frequently ponder some of the parallels between your father's new life in Devonville and yours in McGregor. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so my father came from a land-owning family. My grandfather was very keen that all his sons did something with the land. And he sent my father off to France to study horticulture. And he came back just before World War II and started farming vineyards, etc., and of course, when he left, he never realized that they weren't coming back. And eventually in South Africa, he married my stepmother because my own mother died. And he started farming on her land, which was more productive than the previous farm that I lived on. And he grew strawberries and vegetables and artichokes and all kinds of things. 
But meantime, I was working away at UCT in academia. When I went home, I would accompany him down to the vegetable patch and do things him, with him there. He sold all of these vegetables. He, we also had chickens, battery chickens, which uh, we, we sold at a farm store on the road. And so that instilled in me an interest in farming. And when I retired, I've got a plot here where I grow my own vegetables, very much like he did. And I now wish that I spent more time in learning more from him, but I was too busy with my own academic life to, to, to learn about vegetables and so on. And can you also tell us how your piece was again shattered in February 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine? That was really kind of, well, for everybody it was traumatic. But in my case, I was so familiar with the town of Lviv. That's where my father, when he left me the map to find the treasure, he also left me some instructions. Before I went to the family estate, I went to spend some time in Lviv where my father grew up so I had the address of the house where he grew up as a schoolboy, and it's still there. It's a big double-story house. The first time I went, it was occupied. It was still communist, and they didn't want me to go nearby. They thought maybe I was coming. A foreigner was coming to claim back the house or something, but I just wanted to see it. And more importantly, I found my grandfather's grave in something called the Wyshakovska Cemetery in Lviv as well. It's a world-renowned, beautiful cemetery. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So there I found my grandfather's grave buried in 1960. And interestingly, he spent the post-war years with the Catholic Church. The communists were trying to close it down, the particular church that he was a member of, but he spent his years negotiating with the communist government to keep it going. Although he's died, that dispute is still going with the city of Lviv, which are still trying to get uh, their hands on the church because it's got the biggest organ pipes in, this, in the town of Lviv. So there's a kind of arrangement about that, that they can share it with the church. And lastly, Jan, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? For me, I'm so happy that I can be seen with all my medical problems that I've had because people can't see that I'm a hemophiliac and they can't see that I'm HIV positive. And I can't emphasize enough how lonely it was in the 90s I was diagnosed in 1985, but from 1985 to 1995, it was a big secret. People didn't talk about being HIV positive. It was very difficult, and I'm hoping that people will get some inspiration from that. But also, it's a little boy's treasure story about having a map and finding the silver, and maybe I must just say another word about that because I didn't really finish that. So what happened in my first year of retirement, I coincidentally met an author who... I describe in the book, who took us on a road trip to the Ukraine. This author is half Polish and half Ukrainian. And then we went to the site, to the little village. We met an old peasant woman and a man who remembered my father or my grandfather. I'm not sure because he lived in the farm. So it was really like finding my roots. And then this needle in the haystack situation, all I had was a very crude map that my father drew up on a piece of full scale paper. It looked like a like a lot of scratches, and he, he drew where the house was because the Russians demolished the house, but he drew a dotted line from the foundations of the house through to the forest, and he said, you must dig there. So it was a very unlikely uh, situation of finding it. I never believed. I thought, oh, I must try. It was a real needle in the haystack situation, um, but eventually we managed to, to find it, um, which is all set out in the book, and then we had some adventures afterwards with what to do with the silver, but I'll leave that to the readers. That was Jan Glazuski speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about blood and silver, a true story of survival and a son's search for his family treasure.